What did Paracelsus contribute to alchemy? Paracelsus, 1493-1541, shared the Neoplatonic beliefs of most alchemists, decay is the beginning of all birth. Prime matter separates out of ultimate immaterial matter and human creativity repeats this process. Time is a cycle composed of force and growing, and above and below, or heaven and earth, are the same in form. However, Paracelsus replaced the planetary theory of humors with a chemical one. Salt, sweet, bitter, sour, and the fifth element or quintessence life. His term ends natural referred to the balance of the chemical humors. And ends spiritual was the balance of the mind. Unlike many of his colleagues, Paracelsus did not think that insanity was caused by demons or that nightmares represented sexual intercourse with succubi. He taught that the mind can create diseases in itself. The body, or in the minds or bodies of others via hypnosis, magic, or ill will. He thought that most diseases are curable evils but that no doctor can correct ends DEI, or the will of God. Paracelsus was accused of heresy for his Neoplatonic notion of prime matter and for asserting that illness was not evil. Prime matter contradicted the idea that God created everything. Also, saying that illness was not evil left no room for the devil. But, after his death, his birthplace became a shrine for Roman Catholics. What did Paracelsus contribute to alchemy? Paracelsus, 1493-1541, shared the Neoplatonic beliefs of most alchemists, decay is the beginning of all birth. Prime matter separates out of ultimate immaterial matter and human creativity repeats this process. Time is a cycle composed of force and growing, and above and below, or heaven and earth, are the same in form. However, Paracelsus replaced the planetary theory of humors with a chemical one. Salt, sweet, bitter, sour, and the fifth element or quintessence life. His term ends natural referred to the balance of the chemical humors. And ends spiritual was the balance of the mind. Unlike many of his colleagues, Paracelsus did not think that insanity was caused by demons or that nightmares represented sexual intercourse with succubi. He taught that the mind can create diseases in itself. The body, or in the minds or bodies of others via hypnosis, magic, or ill will. He thought that most diseases are curable evils but that no doctor can correct ends DEI, or the will of God. Paracelsus was accused of heresy for his Neoplatonic notion of prime matter and for asserting that illness was not evil. Prime matter contradicted the idea that God created everything. Also, saying that illness was not evil left no room for the devil. But, after his death, his birthplace became a shrine for Roman Catholics.
What were some noteworthy advances in medicine during the scientific revolution? During the scientific revolution, William Harvey, 1579 to 1657, correctly described and demonstrated the closed circulatory system of blood. Robert Burton, 1577 to 1640, described and lived out the nature of psychological depression. With Harvey's achievement, the inside of the human body could be understood as an orderly mechanical hydraulic system. With Burton's achievement came the recognition of mental illness as a secular, pedestrian process. Both achievements were practical and gratifying rewards for scientific investigators, as well as their public. What were some noteworthy advances in medicine during the scientific revolution? During the scientific revolution, William Harvey, 1579 to 1657, correctly described and demonstrated the closed circulatory system of blood. Robert Burton, 1577 to 1640, described and lived out the nature of psychological depression. With Harvey's achievement, the inside of the human body could be understood as an orderly mechanical hydraulic system. With Burton's achievement came the recognition of mental illness as a secular, pedestrian process. Both achievements were practical and gratifying rewards for scientific investigators, as well as their public. How did William Harvey discover the closed circulatory system? William Harvey, c. 1578 or 1579-1657, was educated at Cambridge and studied at Padua. Where Copernicus, 1473-1543, had also studied. His father-in-law was a prominent London physician, and Harvey became a doctor at St. Bartholomew's Hospital and a Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. IBN Alnafi, 1213-1288, and Michael Servetus, 1511-1553, had described pulmonary circulation earlier. But Servetus' work was lost by the time Harvey had begun his research. Hieronymus Fabricius, who taught Harvey at the University of Padua. Had discovered valves in veins, but Harvey was not satisfied with his explanation. And sought a more encompassing theory of how blood moved in the body. In his 1628 Exercitation Anatomica de Motus Cordis et Sanguinis in Animalibus. An anatomical exercise on the motion of the heart and blood in animals. Harvey claimed that the heart pumped blood throughout the body in a closed system. Galen had believed that venous blood came from the liver and arterial blood from the heart. Each of which sent blood to the different parts of the body where it was consumed. Harvey recorded his observations during vivisections, dissections of live animals. 
quantifying the amount of blood that passed through the heart and counting the beats of the heart. He estimated the amount of blood pumped in a day, depending on the size of the heart. He postulated two circulatory loops one to the lungs and the other to the vital organs and he correctly described the role of the valves of the veins in returning blood to the heart. Harvey was personal physician to both James I and Charles I. That gave him the opportunity to vivisect deer from the royal parks for his experiments and demonstrations. He was also able to observe a pumping human heart in the hole of the chest of a viscount's son whose wound had been covered with a metal plate. Harvey was not able to observe capillaries and could not account for the transfer of blood from arteries to veins. How did William Harvey discover the closed circulatory system? William Harvey, c. 1578 or 1579-1657, was educated at Cambridge and studied at Padua, where Copernicus, 1473-1543, had also studied. His father-in-law was a prominent London physician, and Harvey became a doctor at St. Bartholomew's Hospital and a Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. Ibn Al-Nafi, 1213-1288, and Michael Servetus, 1511-1553, had described pulmonary circulation earlier. But Servetus' work was lost by the time Harvey had begun his research. Hieronymus Fabricius, who taught Harvey at the University of Padua. Had discovered valves in veins, but Harvey was not satisfied with his explanation. And sought a more encompassing theory of how blood moved in the body. In his 1628 Exercitation Anatomica de Motus Cordis et Sanguinis in Animalibus. An anatomical exercise on the motion of the heart and blood in animals. Harvey claimed that the heart pumped blood throughout the body in a closed system. Galen had believed that venous blood came from the liver and arterial blood from the heart, each of which sent blood to the different parts of the body where it was consumed. Harvey recorded his observations during vivisections, dissections of live animals. Quantifying the amount of blood that passed through the heart and counting the beats of the heart. He estimated the amount of blood pumped in a day, depending on the size of the heart. He postulated two circulatory loops one to the lungs and the other to the vital organs and he correctly described the role of the valves of the veins in returning blood to the heart. Harvey was personal physician to both James I and Charles I. That gave him the opportunity to vivisect deer from the royal parks for his experiments and demonstrations. He was also able to observe a pumping human heart in the hole of the chest of a viscount's son whose wound had been covered with a metal plate. Harvey was not able to observe capillaries and could not account for the transfer of blood from arteries to veins. How did Montaigne convey his ideas?
Montaigne, 1533-1592, used an indirect approach to explaining his ideas. Which was not surprising for someone as intellectually sophisticated about literature, philosophy, and history as he was. Montaigne translated Natural Theology, or, The Book of Creatures. Written from 1420 to 1430, by Raymond Sebend, a 15th century Spanish theologian. Who had taught at the University of Toulouse, where Montaigne had studied. The University of Toulouse offered much advanced and humanistic thinking. At that time in a curriculum that encouraged intellectual creativity. Montaigne's translation, The Apology of Raymond Sebond, was the result of Montaigne's original embellishments. His primary thesis was that sensory and intellectual knowledge are uncertain. His conclusion was that judgment should therefore be suspended concerning matters that go beyond experience. Along the way to that conclusion, Montaigne discussed many conflicts of opinion that were relevant to disputes current in his day. What ideals for scientists did the early Royal Society promote? After a rejection of Aristotelian ideals of certainty in scientific knowledge, members of the Royal Society sought what was no more than probably true. Their ideals included open-mindedness, cooperation, and goodwill toward colleagues. It was as important to know what one did not know as assert what one did. Here is how Thomas Spratt, in his 1667 History of the Royal Society, described the virtues of a virtuoso, the natural philosopher is to begin where the moral ends. It is requested that he who goes about such an undertaking, should first know himself. Should be well practiced in all the modest, humble, friendly virtues. Should be willing to be taught, and to give way to the judgment of others. And I dare boldly say, that a plain, industrious man, so prepared, is more likely to make a good philosopher than all the high. Earnest, insulting wits, who can neither bear partnership, nor opposition. For certainly, such men, whose minds are so soft, so yielding, so complying, so large, are in a far better way than the bold and haughty assertors, they will pass by nothing, by which they may learn. They will be always ready to receive, and communicate observations, they will not contemn the fruits of others' diligence. They will rejoice to see mankind benefited, whether it be by themselves, or others. What was Francis Bacon's New Atlantis about? Francis Bacon's New Atlantis was published in 1626 and went through 10 editions by 1670 in it was described the House of Solomon, a research institute with laboratories for experimentation and observation in the natural sciences to include heat, light, cold, medicine, minerals, weather, crafts, astronomy, animals, 
and agriculture. There would be a staff of 36 fellows and their assistants, who would set out to make discoveries. Resident scholars would read written works on past discoveries. Three interpreters of nature would assess all of this information to construct axioms and principles. What was alchemy? The Latin motto of alchemy was Salve T Coagula, which means separate and combine. Alchemy was practiced throughout the Christian, Islamic, and Jewish world until the 19th century and beyond. Traditionally, the central project of practicing alchemists was to discover how to turn base metals into gold. Second to this was a search for the elixir of life, which would cure all sickness and enable immortality. Medieval alchemists sought a philosopher's stone, which they believed would make both tasks possible. And they also worked on formulas for a universal solvent or aquavite. One form of aquavite has endured as a concentrated ethanol liquid, ethyl alcohol. Was Montaigne the only skeptical philosopher to reason in this Pyrrhonic way? No. Montaigne, 1533-1592, derived his views from Sextus Empiricus, 160-210 CE. Who held that we could not even know whether we had knowledge in certain cases. By 1590, Sextus Empiricus, 150-210, Hypotosis had been published in Latin, Greek, and English. Pyrrhonic skepticism died out by the 3rd century CE Desideratus Erasmus. 1466 to 1536 was a closer predecessor to Montaigne, who defended Catholicism based on faith in De Libro Arbitro. 1524, on the grounds that theological controversies were inconclusive. Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546 responded to Erasmus with a dogmatic claim about his subjective certainty about God. Based on his own conscience, as well as scripture. What has medicine got to do with the history of philosophy? The theory and practice of medicine is not usually associated with philosophers or the history of philosophy, except for recognition of the ethical aspects of many medical decisions, for example, abortion, end of life issues, and cost of care, medical doctors do not seek out philosophical opinions and philosophers do not view medicine as part of their normal range of subjects. Nevertheless, until at least the 18th century, medical ideas and practices concerning the human body were closely connected to philosophy in several ways. Since ancient times, beginning with both Plato and Aristotle, philosophers used the kind of knowledge Necessary for the practice of medicine as an important example of the nature of practical knowledge, in general. 
For instance, doctors may agree on the cause and symptoms of a disease. But deciding that a certain patient has the disease and what the appropriate course of treatment for that person should be requires making judgments that go beyond the evidence. Such judgments depend heavily on what was done in similar cases in past experience. And that says something important about the nature of practical knowledge. Aristotle said that because of the importance of the role of experience in medicine, which was not an exact science, it would be wiser to choose an older than a younger doctor. In Aristotle's time there was awareness that medicine had been part of philosophy during the pre-Socratic period. Beginning in the medieval period, especially in Islamic culture, Many philosophers had practical training as physicians and were employed as doctors to their patrons. That practice was also common through the Renaissance and early modern period in Europe. Another link between medicine and philosophy is that, as educated thinkers, philosophers have always had ideas about the human body and its functions which in their scientific aspects have come from the medical views of their times. Philosophers have also maintained an interest in human emotions and thought processes. Based on theories developed by psychologists and their predecessors before the science of psychology existed, What were some examples of Montaigne's famous wit? Montaigne had sayings from Sextus Empiricus, 160 to 210 c. e, carved into the beams of the rafters of his study. His favorite, which became his own motto and the motto of the essays. Was K. Sayus J. E., or What Do I Know? The following aphorisms are excerpts from his essays. Wise men have more to learn of fools than fools of wise men. From the same sheet of paper on which a judge writes his sentence against an adulterer. He tears off a piece to scribble a love note to his colleague's wife. Don't discuss yourself, for you are bound to lose, if you belittle yourself. You are believed, and if you praise yourself, you are disbelieved. Even on the most exalted throne in the world we are only sitting on our own ass. Fashion is the science of appearances, and it inspires one with the desire to seem rather than to be. He who is not strong in memory should not meddle with lying. I will fight the right side to the fire, but excluding the fire if I can. There are some defeats more triumphant than victories. Age prints more wrinkles in the mind than it does in the face, and souls are never or very rarely seen, that in growing old do not smell sour and musty. Books are a languid pleasure. Even in the midst of compassion we feel within I know not what tart sweet titillation of malicious pleasure in seeing others suffer, children have the same feeling. Few men are admired by their servants. The greatest thing in the world is to know how to belong to oneself.
What roles did others play in furthering Francis Bacon's ideas? Samuel Hartlib, c. 1600-1662, a wealthy merchant with an interest in science, wrote description of the famous kingdom of Macaria. About a center of practical learning, inspired by Bacon's new Atlantis. Hartlib's friend, William Petty, 1623-1687, the founder of modern economics. Envisioned a center for teaching practical trades, which he first proposed to Robert Boyle, 1627-1691. A more theoretical precedent for these plans already existed in Gresham College, which was founded by Elizabeth I's financial agent in 1598. Professors there lectured on law, Physics, Rhetoric, Divinity, Music, Geometry, and Astronomy to scholars, nobles, and business and professional men. How did William Harvey discover the closed circulatory system? William Harvey, c. 1578 or 1579-1657, was educated at Cambridge and studied at Padua. Where Copernicus, 1473-1543, had also studied. His father-in-law was a prominent London physician, and Harvey became a doctor at St. Bartholomew's Hospital and a Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. I.B.N. Alnafi, 1213-1288, and Michael Servetus, 1511-1553, had described pulmonary circulation earlier. But Servetus' work was lost by the time Harvey had begun his research. Hieronymus Fabricius, who taught Harvey at the University of Padua. Had discovered valves in veins, but Harvey was not satisfied with his explanation. And sought a more encompassing theory of how blood moved in the body. In his 1628 Exercitation Anatomica de Motus Cortis et Sanguinis in Animalibus. An anatomical exercise on the motion of the heart and blood in animals. Harvey claimed that the heart pumped blood throughout the body in a closed system. Galen had believed that venous blood came from the liver and arterial blood from the heart, each of which sent blood to the different parts of the body where it was consumed. Harvey recorded his observations during vivisections, dissections of live animals. Quantifying the amount of blood that passed through the heart and counting the beats of the heart. He estimated the amount of blood pumped in a day, depending on the size of the heart. He postulated two circulatory loops one to the lungs and the other to the vital organs and he correctly described the role of the valves of the veins in returning blood to the heart. Harvey was personal physician to both James I and Charles I. That gave him the opportunity to vivisect deer from the royal parks for his experiments and demonstrations. He was also able to observe a pumping human heart in the hole of the chest of a viscount's son whose wound had been covered with a metal plate. Harvey was not able to observe capillaries and could not account for the transfer of blood from arteries to veins.
What were Alchemian's innovations in medicine? Alchemian, c. 500 BCE provided new answers to the question, what is health? He explained health as isonomia, or physical equilibrium. This equilibrium was a balance of opposites, which can't be restored indefinitely. Therefore, all living things die. What were the new logic and four types of idols made famous by Francis Bacon's Novum Organum? In his New Atlantis, 1627, Francis Bacon, 1561-1626 Described a social organization for scientific research his Novum Organum, 1620, presented a new logic of induction, which would take the place of both Aristotelian logic and a simple collection of facts. The aim was to discover real natural laws or reliable generalizations about aspects of nature Bacon's system. Became famous for the obstacles to acquiring such knowledge, which he described as four kinds of idols. First were idols of the tribe or natural tendencies of thought, such as a search for purposes in nature or reading human desires and needs onto natural things and events. The second were the idols of the cave or the idiosyncrasies and biases of individuals due to their education. Social background, association, and the authorities they favored. The third type were idols of the marketplace or meanings of words taken for. Granted when the words themselves did not stand for anything that existed in reality. And, finally, the idols of the theater were the influence of theories that had already been widely accepted. What is the problem of the criterion as put forth by Montaigne? Montaigne's more theoretical arguments went to the heart of theories of knowledge. All human knowledge comes from sense experience, but all humans perceive things differently. And we are all vulnerable to illusions, dreams, and ordinary distortions of perception. On top of these doubts, Montaigne then introduced the problem of the criterion. We need a criterion to determine if our experience is reliable as a basis for knowledge. But the criterion itself needs to be tested and for that a second criterion is necessary. And to test this second criterion, a third one is necessary, and on and on. All theoretical and natural philosophers after Montaigne had to come up with some sort of answer to the skeptical problems he raised. The unreliability of sensory information, the disagreement of experts. Cultural differences in values and customs, individual differences in perception, the possibility of human error. And above all, the necessity for a criterion, or neutral standard to settle disagreements. Was Newton an eccentric personality?
According to historical anecdotes and gossip, the answer would have to be yes. There is evidence that Newton, 1642-1727, was eccentric and did not interact well with Auth ERS. His main quirk was his secretiveness about his work. He did not even communicate the success of his early research to others until 1669. To this day. It is not clear when he did what or which recorded intuitions correspond to what publications. After he got the position of Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge, except for three or four weeks a year. He spent 26 years in Cambridge, lecturing on optics and elementary mathematics. That is, his life was somewhat sheltered. Part of the reason Newton hated to publish was that he did. Not like the controversy that was always likely to follow. When in 1684 the Royal Society appointed a committee, led by Edmund Halley, 1656-1742. To remind Newton of his commitment to publish Principia Mathematica. Halley had to persuade him to include the third book, which contained the application of his system. Newton at first wanted to suppress that work because he had heard that Robert Hooke, 1635 to 1703, claimed to have had the same system before him. Indeed, when Newton had related his discoveries about the decomposition of light, or what the components of light are, to the Royal Society in 1672. Robert Hooke and others disagreed with part of how he explained his findings. Newton refused to discuss the matter or publish his work until after Hooke died. The Principia manuscript was finally delivered by a Dr. Vincent, husband of Miss Story, at whose house Newton had lodged in his teens. Apparently she had been the sole romantic interest in his entire life. Biographers relate that Newton had a psychological breakdown from 1692 to 1693. Following unsuccessful attempts to get a prestigious and lucrative government position through the efforts of his friend Charles Halifax. Newton wrote to Samuel Pepys, 1633 to 1703, that he was extremely troubled at the embroilment he was in and that he would have to withdraw from Pepys and his other friends. He then wrote to John Locke, 1632-1704, apologizing for being of the opinion that you endeavored to embroil me with women. Locke was kind and reassuring and Newton apologized further, claiming overwork and lack of sleep. Apparently, there had been no basis in fact for Newton's belief in having been embroiled. Newton did have an embroiled dispute over whether he or Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. 1646 to 1716, had first invented the theory of flux ions or the differential calculus. Through his office as president of the Royal Society, Newton exerted influence over the investigation of the matter, which was finally resolved to credit him with the discovery. Although it misrepresented the time sequence of correspondence on the subject between Newton and Leibniz, Newton did no further scientific work after his position as Warden of the Mint. He referred to natural philosophy as a litigious lady and mentioned another pull at the moon. He was apparently preoccupied with occult readings of biblical prophecy and alchemical theories. 
although the nature of these endeavors is still unclear because he often wrote in code. Some contemporary scholars now think that these occult studies were Newton's main interest and that the greatness of his scientific achievements was largely the result of hype, after the fact. Newton's reluctance to publish or even continue his studies after he became warden of the mint might be less a matter of psychological instability than is often assumed. Why was Montaigne important? Michel Ikem de Montaigne, 1533-1592, the essayist who became mayor of his hometown of Bordeaux. France, resurrected the ancient Greek skepticism of Sextus Empiricus, 160-210 c. E, with some reliance on Cicero. Although Montaigne lived during the end of the Renaissance. His ideas set the stage for much thought that would follow during the scientific revolution and early modern philosophy. In the history of ideas and philosophy, he is therefore much more than a Renaissance figure. What was the Invisible College? In 1645 Robert Boyle, 1627-1691, and other younger scientists met weekly over lunch to discuss current scientific news about research in England and Europe. They called themselves the Invisible College. They discussed the Copernican theory, William Harvey's evidence for the closed circulation of blood. Barometric experiments with mercury, and studies of magnetism. After England's King Charles I was beheaded, this group and their friends, who had academic posts at Oxford, organized the Philosophical Society of Oxford. Following a lecture on astronomy at Gresham College by Christopher Wren, 1632 to 1723 in 1660 plans were made to found a college for providing physio-mathematical learning charles ii approved their plans within a week there were 115 original members one third were scientists and the first president was lord brunecker the leading mathematician of the day this was the Royal Society of London for the Improvement of Natural Knowledge. It was presented with a silver mace by King Charles II at its inaugural meeting on July 15, 1662. It exists to this day. As an independent academy for scientific knowledge in the United Kingdom. Once the idols are eliminated what did this allow us to do, according to Bacon? Once the mind was cleared of its idols, it would be able to discover causes through experimentation. Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, thought that all of nature was made up of bodies or material objects that acted according to fixed laws. These laws were the forms of material objects. In seeking causes, first we must look for those things from which certain other things always follow. For example, 
heat is followed by a motion of particles. Next, we look for the cases where the effects do not happen when the cause is absent. No heat, no movement of particles. When what we are studying occurs to a greater or lesser degree. We must be able to account for the variation. Whenever possible, we should invent instruments to measure what we are investigating. In this case, thermometers and barometers. What is fideism and what does it have to do with what Montaigne demonstrated about skepticism? Montaigne, 1533-1592, demonstrated how skepticism could be a double-edged sword. It could be used to reject irrational claims, and it could be used to attack the certainty of any body of knowledge. Including scientific knowledge based on the senses and the conclusions of logical reasoning. This made skepticism extremely useful for Catholic. Theologians attacking the claims of Protestants, and vice versa. Today, we think of skeptics as those who require careful scientific evidence for claims and judgments. Usually a skeptic is someone who will not take anything on faith. But Montaigne showed that even the best evidence, including sensory information, can be doubted, so that for him, the skeptic is someone who is better off relying on faith. What Montaigne had in mind was not only faith about knowledge that could not be proved to a certainty, but a life of faith in which all attempts at rigorous knowledge were avoided. This is known as fideism. What was Bacon's influence? Francis Bacon's, 1561-1626, requirements for causal explanations were Universally accepted as the basic principles of methodology in the new science. In the 19th century, the empiricist philosopher John Stuart Mill 1806-1873, restated them as the basis of scientific investigation in his time. Bacon's aspirations for an association of scientists were eventually realized in the British Royal Society. Bacon's methodological principles, combined with Kepler's theory of elliptical orbits were built on by Isaac Newton, 1643-1727 for his culminating scientific system of the fundamental structure and operating laws of the universe and Newton's work was to hold at least until Albert Einstein's 1879-1955, Theories in the Early 20th Century How did medicine progress after Hippocrates? Galen of Pergamum, C. 129 C 216 CE, preserved Hippocratic medicine, which continued largely unchanged through the Renaissance. Galen was able to increase knowledge of physiology by dissecting pigs and apes. Since human dissection was against Roman law, 
he learned how to treat trauma and wounds while working as a physician in a gladiator school. Galen performed many operations, including brain and eye surgery. The removal of cataracts, which were not attempted again for almost 2,000 years. He eventually became a physician to Marcus Aurelius, 121 to 180 CE, in the 9th century. Galen's writings were translated into Arabic by Hunan ibn Ishaq, 809 to 873. However, the Arabs rarely practiced surgery, and among Christians. The knowledge and practice of surgery had already been abolished. Galen remained so highly regarded that when dissections during the Renaissance appeared to contradict his descriptions, they were considered anomalous. His prescription of bloodletting for almost every illness was followed as late as the 19th century. Who was Robert Boyle? Robert Boyle, 1627-1691, was the 14th child of the first Earl of Cork. Who was the richest man in England? As the founder of modern chemistry, Boyle devoted his life to scientific investigation and methodology. He was well received at the British court, and a member of the Council of the Royal Society. Although he declined its presidency and the provostship of Eton because he did not want to take oaths. When he retired to a house in Pall Mall after a stroke at age 42, he maintained his own laboratory. Boyle's goal was to replace Aristotelian mechanics with explanations using just two things. Matter and motion. He was also a champion of the new atomism, or corpuscular theory. Boyle's most famous works were new experiments, physico-mechanical touching the spring of the air and its effects. The skeptical chemist, and the experimental history of colors. He also wrote a religious novel, Seraphic Love. What was some of the Catholic response to Martin Luther's dogmatism? The Catholic response was to question whether Luther really had any knowledge at all and to emphasize the importance of Christian faith. Gentian Hervet published a 1569 edition of Sextus Hypotosis, specifically as a cure for dogmatism, which would lead to serene confidence in the Church's doctrine of Jesus. Portuguese philosopher and physician Francisco Sanchez, c. 1551 to 1623 developed Pyrrhonic skepticism as a criticism of Aristotelianism in Quad Nihil Sitter, 1576. Although in his arguments for nominalism, combined with empirical observation, that led him to conclude that knowledge itself could not be obtained, Sanchez was closer to academic than Pyrrhonic skepticism. Who were the natural philosophers? Natural philosophy was the term used to describe what we now call science. 
the key players in the scientific revolution, beginning with Galileo. 1564 to 1642 and ending with Isaac Newton, 1643 to 1727. Were called natural philosophers and were revered as geniuses by philosophers of their day. The lines between scientific inquiry, philosophical theories of knowledge, and philosophy of science were not clearly drawn until these natural philosophers' discoveries and theories helped define them. What were some noteworthy advances in medicine during the scientific revolution? During the scientific revolution, William Harvey, 1579-1657 Correctly described and demonstrated the closed circulatory system of blood. Robert Burton, 1577-1640, described, and lived out, the nature of psychological depression. With Harvey's achievement, the inside of the human body could be understood as an orderly mechanical hydraulic system. With Burton's achievement came the recognition of mental illness as a secular, pedestrian process. Both achievements were practical and gratifying rewards for scientific investigators, as well as their public. What are some other notable works by Montaigne? In addition to his skeptical writings, Montaigne, 1533-1592, became famous for the whole of his essays. 1560, literally, attempts, the most substantial of which was his The Apology of Raymond VII. The essays here were far-ranging, witty, digressive, and all about him, his tastes, opinions and large and petty problems. He also wrote about his trip to Germany, Switzerland, and Italy in his journal De Voyage en Italie par la Suisse et à la en 1580 et 1581, travel journal. Undertaken after he had presented a copy of his essays to the French king. Montaigne was diplomatically active in trying to quell religious antagonism and instrumental in securing Henry of Navarre's ascension to the throne as King Henry IV. He probably would have become a member of Henry's court had illness not intervened. What were Hippocrates' accomplishments and influence? In founding his own school, Hippocrates, 465 to 370 B. C. E. formally established medicine as distinct from theurgy, natural magic, and philosophy. He himself had learned medicine from his father and grandfather. According to the Hippocratic school, illness was caused by an imbalance of four humors that were supposed to be equal in the body, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. Every disease progressed to a crisis, from which either death or natural recovery would ensue. 
Hippocratic medical practice was passive because it was believed that the body would heal itself given rest and immobilization. The therapy was always gentle, and usually only clean water, wine, or bombs were used. Being able to predict the course of an illness was considered important. In his On the Physician, Hippocrates stressed good grooming and a sober demeanor for doctors. It was important to keep records. Not only about the patient but also about the patient's family and circumstances. Mystical causes of illness were dismissed. After Hippocrates' death, there was little advancement in the principles attributed to him. And some of his professional rules, such as taking case histories and keeping records, fell into disuse. What is Kepler famous for? Based on the principle that causes needed to be sought for observed planetary motions. Both regular and exceptional, Johannes Kepler, 1571-1630. Posited both a force between planets and the Sun and also a force to propel the planets. Isaac Newton, 1643 to 1727, was to show that a principle of inertia could be used instead of the force to propel the planets. Kepler's most famous contribution was the discovery that the planets moved in elliptical rather than circular orbits. What did Paracelsus contribute to alchemy? Paracelsus, 1493-1541, shared the Neoplatonic beliefs of most alchemists, decay is the beginning of all birth. Prime matter separates out of ultimate immaterial matter and human creativity repeats this process. Time is a cycle composed of force and growing, and above and below, or heaven and earth, are the same in form. However, Paracelsus replaced the planetary theory of humors with a chemical one. Salt, sweet, bitter, sour, and the fifth element or quintessence life. His term ends natural referred to the balance of the chemical humors. And ends spiritual was the balance of the mind. Unlike many of his colleagues, Paracelsus did not think that insanity was caused by demons or that nightmares represented sexual intercourse with succubi. He taught that the mind can create diseases in itself. The body, or in the minds or bodies of others via hypnosis, magic, or ill will. He thought that most diseases are curable evils but that no doctor can correct ends DEI, or the will of God. Paracelsus was accused of heresy for his Neoplatonic notion of prime matter and for asserting that illness was not evil. Prime matter contradicted the idea that God created everything. Also, saying that illness was not evil left no room for the devil. But, after his death, his birthplace became a shrine for Roman Catholics. How were alchemists regarded by their peers?
alchemists were regarded with suspicion by traditional thinkers and theologians. But their constant experimentation with metals and plant stuff resulted in discoveries useful in tanning, dyeing, metallurgy, and other so called Baconian sciences. The figure of the Magus, or wise man, or sorcerer, or even warlock, was associated with alchemy throughout its history. The science of modern chemistry had its early experimental roots in alchemy. Which some think is the main reason why it was not accepted as part of the scientific curriculum in higher learning until well into the 19th century. The theory behind alchemy was Neoplatonic. Its main principle, as above, so below, meant that man was a microcosm of the cosmos. In addition, time was believed to be cyclical. And the universe was seen as a being that is alive with divine spirit. Was Bacon's life as direct and clear as his ideas? No. Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, lived a complex life with active political involvement in the affairs of his time. Great ambition, and the appearance of deviousness. He was born in London and raised as a gentleman. His father, Nicholas, served Queen Elizabeth I as Lord Keeper of the Great Seal. Francis entered Trinity College, Cambridge, at age 12 and soon met the Queen. At the age of 15, he is said to have learned that he was Queen Elizabeth's illegitimate son from her secret marriage to Robert Dudley, at which Nicholas Bacon had been a witness. When his father died suddenly in 1579, it disturbed Francis' prospects for a substantial inheritance. This initiated a lifetime of debt. He began to study law and took a seat in Parliament in 1584 and again in 1586. He urged the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, a Catholic rival to Elizabeth's throne. Then he met Queen Elizabeth's favourite, Robert Devereux. Second Earl of Essex, who was to prove useful as his patron for a while. Bacon applied for a succession of high offices that eluded him, although Essex helped him financially. He did get the post of Queen's Council in 1596, but it paid no salary. In 1586 he was briefly arrested for debt. He took an active role in investigating treason charges against his friend and patron. Essex, who was executed in 1601. At the age of 45, he married Alice Barnum. Who was the 14-year-old daughter of a well-connected alderman. After James I became king, Bacon was knighted. He served the king well and was rewarded with the office of solicitor, then attorney general. And finally Lord Chancellor in 1618. He again fell into debt, however. During this time he was accused and convicted of bribery. His sentence was a fine and disgrace. He continued his studies while in retirement and was honored at age 60 with a banquet held by his Rosicrucian and Masonic friends.
the famous poet Ben Jonson attended and said of him. I love the man and do honor his memory above all others. In 1626 Bacon was in London, traveling through the snow with the king's physician. When he got the idea of using snow to preserve meat, they immediately bought a fowl, had it killed, and Bacon stuffed it with snow. He came down with pneumonia and ate the bird, hoping to regain his strength from it, but died nonetheless. How did the British Royal Society come about? He British Royal Society grew out of the Invisible College. And the Invisible College was inspired by Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. Who were the philosophical rationalists? The philosophical rationalists believed that there was a priori knowledge about the world. Or general truths about the world known by the mind, without experience. This was in contrast to the empiricist insistence that all of our knowledge about the world was based on experience, sensory information in particular. The 17th century philosophical rationalists, such as René Descartes, 1596-1650, were opposed to the intellectual methods of the empiricists, but they still took science into account in their philosophies. Descartes was actively involved in scientific exploration and experimentation throughout his philosophical career. In the late 18th century, David Hume's 1711-1776 empiricism posed a special problem for Immanuel Kant. 1724 to 1804, because Hume, 1711 to 1776, applied skepticism to basic beliefs that many had taken for granted before him, such as the existence of God and the powers of natural causes to bring about their effects. In the 19th century, modern reactions against empiricism took hold in the Work of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900. And early existentialist philosophers, such as Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855. These reactions shared a concern for the validity of a priori truths and religious knowledge. When discussing religious belief, which did Montaigne consider to be more important, reason or faith? In considering reason versus faith as a foundation for religious beliefs, Montaigne, 1533-1592, claimed that faith. Simple belief was the best course, because all reasoning can be shown to be unsound. Philosophical views had been in conflict since the ancients, so only Pyrrhonic skepticism, with its prescribed suspension of judgment, was acceptable. There was no certainty even in the knowledge of the new sciences. Since the experts disagreed and scientific knowledge was subject to change.
When did medicine become separate from philosophy? Although Hippocrates of Kos II, or Hippocrates of Kos, c. 465 to 370 BCE, is credited with being the father of medicine, Aristotle and Theophrastus. 371 c. 287 BCE, wrote about Alcmion of Croton as the founder of medicine during the second half. Of the 6th century BCE Alcmion also investigated the functions of the different senses. Because the process of understanding was similar to the rotations of the stars. He thought that the soul, like the stars, was immortal. He speculated that sense organs relate information to the brain through passages. When blood moved to the large blood vessels, the result was sleep. Whereas when it became redistributed the result was wakefulness. The specific nature of Alcmion's ideas, and his introduction to medicine of principles unique to that subject. Forever changed the practice of medicine and systematic thought about the human body. As Alcmion's successor, Hippocrates, 465 to 370 BCE, was able to build on his thought and establish medicine as a science in its own right. Who was Paracelsus? Paracelsus was the pseudonym of Philippus or Olus Theophrastus Bombast, a. K. A. Bombastus, von Hohenheim, 1493-1541. His father was a medical doctor in Switzerland. Paracelsus traveled continuously after age 15 and studied medicine in Germany and Austria. He then traveled in Europe, combining surgery with his medical practice. Surgery was then considered a craft lower in status than medicine. So this was a significant risk for any physician. In 1516 Paracelsus became a medical lecturer at the University of Basel. After he cured the famous printer Frobenius. His teachings against Avicenna, 980-1037, and Galen, C129-216 C CE, were controversial. And he was forced to resume his life of travel in 1528. Paracelsus introduced Several lasting medical innovations, chemical urinalysis, a biochemical theory of digestion. Wound antisepsis, the use of laudanum for pain, and the use of mercury for syphilis. His books were mainly about human nature and the place of man in the cosmos. But he also wrote important treatises on syphilis. What was dogmatism? Dogmatism, then and now, was the position that there is at least one true thing about the world that we can know with absolute certainty. What did Francis Bacon contribute to the scientific revolution?
Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, systematized the methodology of empirical science and set forth a program for how science could better human life. He is famous for claiming, knowledge is power, and sought ways to further develop and apply the new sciences to human life in practical ways. He believed that human beings needed to master nature and conduct experiments to discover her secrets 20th century feminists were to take Bacon to task for his assignment of a female gender to nature. Compared to the maleness of scientists who were charged to conquer it. What was the reaction to Burton's The Anatomy of Melancholy? Burton wrote The Anatomy of Melancholy under the pseudonym Democritus Jr. His book was well received. Literary historian and critic Thomas Wharton, 1728-1790, wrote of it. The author's variety of learning, his quotations from rare and curious books. His pedantry sparkling with rude wit and shapeless elegance have rendered it a repertory of amusement and information. Indeed, Burton's treatise is full of satire and it constitutes a prodigious display of historical and literary knowledge. However, the genius of Burton's anatomy lies in its attempt to give a naturalistic account of the mind as both distinct from the body and yet intimately connected with it. Burton's theory of human cognition and consciousness rests on his notion of spirit, through which all of the functions and faculties of mind are physically connected with different parts of the body. While mistaken and overly literal by more modern standards, Burton's general project of investigating mind-body correspondence remains a cornerstone of empirical mind-body and mind-brain scientific research to this day. What was the reaction to Burton's The Anatomy of Melancholy? Burton wrote The Anatomy of Melancholy under the pseudonym Democritus Jr. His book was well received. Literary historian and critic Thomas Wharton, 1728-1790, wrote of it. The author's variety of learning, his quotations from rare and curious books. His pedantry sparkling with rude wit and shapeless elegance have rendered it a repertory of amusement and information. Indeed, Burton's treatise is full of satire and it constitutes a prodigious display of historical and literary knowledge. However, the genius of Burton's anatomy lies in its attempt to give a naturalistic account of the mind as both distinct from the body and yet intimately connected with it. Burton's theory of human cognition and consciousness rests on his notion of spirit, through which all of the functions and faculties of mind are physically connected with different parts of the body. While mistaken and overly literal by more modern standards, Burton's general project of investigating mind-body correspondence remains a cornerstone of empirical mind-body and mind-brain scientific research to this day.
How did Robert Burton apply scientific methods to his own mind? Robert Burton, 1577-1640, spent most of his life at Oxford University, where he was vicar of St. Thomas Church. He was later appointed rector of Segrave, Leicester. He was a mathematician with interests in astrology and was known to be companionable and cheerful. However, he suffered all his life from a heavy heart and hatchling in my head. A kind of imposthume in my head, which I was very desirous to be unladen of. In the preface to the Anatomy of Melancholy, 1621, he explained the work as therapeutic. I write of melancholy, by being busy to avoid melancholy. There is no greater cause of melancholy than idleness, no better cure than business. How did Robert Burton apply scientific methods to his own mind? Robert Burton 1577 to 1640 spent most of his life at Oxford University where he was vicar of St Thomas Church He was later appointed rector of Segrave Leicester He was a mathematician with interests in astrology and was known to be companionable and cheerful However he suffered all his life from a heavy heart and hatchling in my head. A kind of imposthume in my head, which I was very desirous to be unladen of. In the preface to the Anatomy of Melancholy, 1621, he explained the work as therapeutic. I write of melancholy, by being busy to avoid melancholy. There is no greater cause of melancholy than idleness, no better cure than business.